Hey there and welcome into the boardroom, our last boardroom of the season here on Capital City Sports and Fabs. This is your last time in the boardroom too, right? I know, it's, it's kind of weird. I remember a couple years ago I was sitting, actually where Cameron's sitting right now is Corey Burkhardt stood where you stood yeah. and Alex $2 Bill Riley stood where I stood and, <laughs> and it was his last boardroom of the year and I kind of, I just remember I was like, man, that must feel crazy and sure enough, it feels crazy for sure. Well, let's get right to uh, what we do best and that's talk sports let's here talk on CCS. Sports. So let's talk some sports and where else are we going to start but Carolina baseball. Number three in the country. They win number this, two in the country. Number, number two, two in, today. Hey, they're number two today, but that is after beating Vanderbilt this weekend. And one of the biggest parts of the success for the Gamecocks this weekend was the pitching overall from Michael Roth to Matt Bryce. Let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, at the beginning of the year, I was a skeptic of, of Michael Roth, not because of the things that he did last year, but because I didn't know if he could handle the longevity of going deep into a game week after week after week. Not that the Clemson game in the World Series was a fluke, right. but I mean, that was the first time that his arm had really been tested that year. And to know that you're going to have to gain some weight and really, you know, just work that much harder in the offseason to get yourself ready to, to fill a starter role. And, and you also have to fix your mentality as far as you can't just go 100% effort on every pitch. You have to conserve some energy as a starter. But Michael Roth has handled that role beautifully. I mean, he went, went seven and two thirds on Friday night, just SEC pitcher of the week. The guy has been phenomenal week in, week out. He goes into the seventh almost every week. And to be honest with you, that's something that I haven't, I, I didn't expect. But the guy has filled the roles of Blake Cooper like nobody's business, except he's just left-handed. And it's just, it's Blake Cooper leaves, and that's the guy you think, well, the Gamecocks might not be as good because Cooper's not here. Roth steps right in his place and just does a phenomenal job all season. And now let's talk about Matt Price stepping up on Sunday when the series tied 1-1. He goes three innings and has eight strikeouts. On Sunday alone, just an absolutely dominating performance out there. This team is nowhere near where the team that they are without him out there. No, absolutely not. And he actually got the win on Sunday. He's got the second most saves in the SEC. And that, that doesn't change my opinion that he's the best closer in the SEC, bar none. I mean, the guy goes out and three innings into his effort on Sunday was still thrown in the mid-90s. I mean, you know, and you're talking about he is a closer. He throws every pitch 100%. You know, that's the type of mentality that closers have. They go out and they give every pitch 100, 110%. And the fact that he was probably gassed in the ninth and still throwing 90 speaks volumes of how talented this kid is. He's getting the guys out on a regular basis. I mean, the guy is one of the best pitchers in the country, the best players in the SEC, bar none. To have eight strikeouts out of the nine outs that he did get on Sunday, phenomenal. Just phenomenal. You're right, the team is not the same without Matt Price. Now let's talk about the fact that Vanderbilt's pitching put them in an incredible position to have a win this series as well this weekend. Really well, they, silencing the Gamecock bats overall. Well, they did silence the Gamecocks bats, but at the end of the day, Vandy's bullpen, who was supposed to be, you know, this unbreakable bunch of guys, you know, they really opened it up for the Gamecocks. They kind of gave the game away on Sunday in the seventh inning. But then, I mean, you go right back out, and Tanner is not looking away from Matt Price. And the fact that my, Matt Price went back out for the eighth, went back out for the ninth to really seal the deal for what Vandy had given them, that's a high-pressure situation for your guy to go in to try to win a series against your second number one opponent right. this season. I mean, again, it just speaks so much volumes about how good Matt Price really is. Right. So now let's talk about the Gamecock hitting. Not too impressive overall on the weekend, but one guy who did step up more than everyone else was Scott Wingo, guy usually known more for his defense. Yeah, I mean, that's the reason that he's in the lineup is because, I mean, the guy gets dirty, dies after balls, he plays great defense, he's a vacuum out there at second base. But, you know, the main question of him was could he come in and have a productive senior season at the plate, and he has. He went 5 of 10 against Vandy. Uh, Average-wise, he's, he's one of the better guys batting average-wise on the team this year. He's, he's hitting for a higher average than Jackie Bradley, which a lot of people didn't expect. And the fact that he gets hit by so many pitches you know, he gets on base, and I think that's a reason why, you know, Coach Tanner has kind of moved him up to the second spot in the lineup instead of hitting ninth to get him that extra plate appearance, and it's really paid off for the, for the offense. Yeah. Really paid off. And one last thing, Adam Matthews getting hurt on Saturday, sliding into head first, sliding in head first, excuse me, to first base, kind of at the last second looked like he got a little hesitant, and usually that's what leads to injury. So talk about what that's going to mean for this team. Yeah, he re-aggravated that hamstring, but I think the biggest effect that it will have on the team is this. Ray Tanner has moved away from the let's hit the three-run homer to pressure bust the pipe. It's something that Curtis Johnson told me a couple weeks ago. That's how Coach Tanner has changed his coaching mentality. And I think we saw that in the seventh inning on Sunday against Vanderbilt when Robert Barry laid that bunt down 
you know, it, it was a pressure situation. The pitcher for Vandy slipped and couldn't make the throw to first. Everybody was safe. It's tougher to force pressure to bust the pipes if your fastest guy is not on the field. And I think that when it comes to manufacturing runs in tight games, that's where Adam Matthews' absence is going to really hurt the Gamecocks. All right, well, that'll wrap up our coverage of the Vanderbilt series. The Carolina Gamecock baseball team, number two in the country, have yet to lose a series, and they'll look to keep that going next week. But that'll do it with our coverage now, and we'll be back in a little bit to talk football and the spring game. Hey everybody and welcome back to the boardroom here on Capital City Sports. Justin Fabiano being joined by Mike Wadsworth. We we've switched roles for this block of the boardroom to talk spring game. Mike, you were at the spring game and really despite all the offensive talent that the team has uh, with Alshon Jeffrey and Marcus Lattimore, what should fans expect if Steven Garcia does not return? Fans are probably going to be disappointed if Garcia is not in there at quarterback. The difference is probably, I would say, two to three games you could say is the difference when Garcia's in there over Shaw. Shaw just in a spring game when he's backing up in the pocket and he just looks uncomfortable, he's jittery. This is a spring game. He's not going to get hit by his own players. They're going to be lightening up the hits on him. And he just looked jittery, uncomfortable, overthrew some guys. I can remember two instances in particular where he had guys wide open, would have been touchdowns, and he just missed them. Um, he has a, a lot of work to do over the summer if he's going to get himself in a position to be ready to start for this team in the SEC. And it's, you know, hopefully he can prove me wrong. But, um, I mean, my hope is that Steven Garcia comes back, and I really do think he is going to come back. Well, Actually, he'll be back. If he doesn't years. come back, Connor Shaw will be the subject of, you know, a lot of media articles and, and, and stuff like that. When it comes to facing criticism after the Gamecocks lose, I think one of the big questions is how will he bounce back? Because Garcia has proven again and again that he can bounce back from stuff and succeed on the field. And this is true. Shaw really has not been in a position where he's faced criticism on a large scale and had to face that. Now, granted, every time we've had the opportunity to see him speak, he seems like he's got a real level head on his shoulders. He's always talking about the things he has to do to make sure he gets better and how he can help this team get better. So that's always a positive sign and something the fans are going to like to hear. But it's just one of those situations where you never know how someone's going to react until you get there. You look at NFL quarterbacks that get drafted in the top 10 in the draft and are complete busts. You just, it's one of those things that you, you never, never know, know. until oh, yeah. the time gets there. So it's a thing for Connor Shaw. We're just going to have to wait and see. Okay, well, moving on to the other side of the football, the defensive side. A lot of people think that the defense is just going to come on in and be, you know, top 10 defense in the country, but Ellis Johnson says, wait, not so fast. Yeah, as Sam Davis just showed us, um, the defense on the starting lineup is going to look like one of the best defenses in the country and could be the best defense in the country. But Ellis Johnson said, hold on, not so fast. We don't have the depth at this point right now to compete at a high level like that in the SEC especially, where you have teams like Alabama on a regular basis whose defense is stacked deep with number one prospects, you know, high school prospects every single year. So they have a lot of work to do, and specifically in the secondary. Devontae Holloman's gonna be moving up into the box to the spur position this year, and there really isn't a guy in the secondary that knows where everyone's supposed to be and can direct them there. A guy like DJ Swearinger, who stepped up last year in the secondary, extremely athletic, can make plays, and Ellis Johnson knows that, but at the same time, he said Swearinger is not ready to be that guy that's going to be you know, directing the secondary and making sure guys are in the position they're in. So maybe he's just trying to motivate him over the summer to do what he's got to do to step up into that role, or maybe some of the younger guys are going to have to step up. But um, the defense, guys stepping up to lead the secondary, and guys coming in and filling the depth. Well, really having somebody to kind of direct traffic back there in the defense is really kind of an underrated task, and it's something that, you know, it really kind of plagued the Gamecocks last season. So right. we'll see if that, that depth can, can hold up. But for now, that's really all we've got in the boardroom here covering football. We'll have to wait until August to really see how things start to shape up. Yeah. Coming up later in the boardroom, we will talk, well, a year in review in Gamecock sports. Hey there, and welcome back into the boardroom. Mike Wadsworth being joined again by Justin Fabiano. We're here to talk about the past year in Gamecock sports. Now, it all started on June 29, 2010, when the Gamecock baseball team won the national championship. It really served as a motivating factor, I, I think you could say, for the rest of Gamecock athletics. And in this past year, we've seen a lot of first for many sports. Yeah, well, covering the start of summer practice when we got back to Columbia, I mean, Kenny Miles was really like, yeah, I mean, the baseball team did it. Why can't we do it? And sure enough, the football team, they go out, they beat number one Alabama, the first time that 
you know, any any USC uh, football team has ever done that. Um, you know, we thought beating Ole Miss two years ago was, was an accomplishment. You have that. And then they go down to Gainesville where they've never won. They've never beaten Florida in Gainesville. And Steve Spurrier goes down there and wins the SEC East by beating his old school, you know, both as a player and a coach, something that, you know, no one's ever seen. Uh, just a site that was just phenomenal to be there. I mean, it was just really cool seeing him get hoisted up, you know, wearing the other uniform, you know, so to speak, yeah. in his old stomping grounds. I mean, just the storyline there was just really incredible to be a part of. And then, I mean, sure, they got their butts kicked in the SEC championship, but, I mean, yet just another phenomenal atmosphere to be in for as a fan, as a member of the media who covers the team, and, and, and as the team itself. I mean, just remember that, that pregame atmosphere when they announced Cam Newton's name on the Jumbotron. I mean, the Georgia Dome was so loud, and it's not because one team was cheering. It was because either you heard boos or you heard cheers. Every single person in that stadium had something to say, and it was just, I mean, it was the loudest thing that I had ever seen. It was really just an incredible year in, in football, and something that, you know, as a guy who's leaving this institution academically, it was really kind of just a great positive thing to just kind of be able to witness my last year here. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of other Gamecock <clears throat> fans feel that way. You know, but in other sports too. I mean, the men's and women's soccer team both advancing deep into the NCAA tournament. Um, two phenomenal years for them. The women's team actually wasn't quite as good this year as they were two years ago, but I mean, they're really doing a great, great job just building a program there. The women's team and the men's team, you know, beat, beating all the teams that they've beaten and, and the, the loss to Michigan was really kind of a heartbreaking one, but a, but a phenomenal game at that. And then you have Lakia Brookings set, setting her track records. I mean, it really just this entire year has been a phenomenal year so far for really all of Gamecock athletics minus the men's basketball program. Right. And then, as we said, it started with that national championship for the baseball team. And it's really come full circle back to baseball this year. Nearly 25,000 fans came out to this last series against Vandy. Gamecock Nation is just all into baseball. I mean, it's it's really, and the team has done a phenomenal job, or I, I shouldn't say the team, but whoever's in charge of putting that trophy out there on display, who's ever in charge of, of making those murals and the posters and all those kind of things that fans want to take home to keep, to remember. I mean, just, it's been just a phenomenal job. And then, you know, that carries over to the team. The team feels that energy. And, and it's really, they're not as good of a team as they were last year, talent-wise. <laughs> But I mean, Ray Tanner said it said it this weekend. I mean, these guys have a will to win. They're just hungry. And he said it's not coaching. It's nothing that Ray Tanner does. I mean, Ray Tanner does so many great things. But these guys going out there and scrapping to fight for wins is just their hunger to get back to that glory that they they, they were in late June last year. Well, that'll do it for our coverage here of the past year in Gamecock Sports and our final boardroom of the season, Fabs. How's it feel? You know, it, it's, it's bittersweet. I'm excited to graduate. I'm excited to move on, you know, to bigger things in life than college. But, you know, at the same time, it's this past week we've had a lot of reflecting to do because I've had a lot of spare time. And, I mean, just it's been a fun ride. It's been a fun ride with all you guys and the guys in the past, Corey and Jay, uh, Jonathan Hilliard and Ed Cahill and Alex Riley. And uh, just kind of remembering where these guys, you know, stood not too long ago when I was a freshman, a sophomore, and a junior, yeah. you know, to be in these <laughs> shoes now – after so many times just witnessing it happen, you're just like, you know, wow, that's a long way off. It's a long way off. Well, sure enough, it's it's not. And and sure enough, you yeah. guys and, and Cam, you guys will be standing here, you know, doing the same thing with with the younger guys. And uh, I mean, it's 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 been an honor. It's been a lot of fun, um, you know. But sadly, it is time to move on. Now, Fabs, as you know, when your time on CCS comes to an oh, end, oh God, a tribute video is put together in your honor. You've been here as long, longer than anyone that's gone through it since freshman Four year. years. And have been a critical part as of what has made this show what it is now and getting it to this point. It's really come a long way. And I mean, me and Cam especially can thank you for everything you've done helping us get to this point. So we're gonna send it to your tribute video oh, from God, this, this, Fabs. Is, is there any words you want to say before we go to it? Um, well, I'm honored that you guys have done something like that for me. Um, you know, I know how these things are. Uh, but at the same time, I hope it doesn't come back to bite me in the rear end and ruin my career. But thank you, guys. Exactly. Thanks, buddy. And on that note, let's take it to Fab's tribute.